Well, good afternoon all. Um, great to be here on a session about the subject of the reliability of the Gospels. I don't know how many of you have um, read or seen my book. How many of you have read the book? Okay, I, I apologize. There's going to be some repetition here, but hopefully that will be good repetition uh, for you. Um, I just came out with a book uh, in November. I've written a few books before. They are unreadable. The total number of people on the planet who've read them is about 10. Uh, and uh, this is my first attempt to write a readable book. And uh, it's uh, a short book as well. And I thought there are quite a few requirements for me as I write this book. Uh, I thought I wanted it to be short because often what people have is uh, books that would be too long ever to give to a non-Christian unless they were a super interested non-Christian, probably so interested they'd probably already become a Christian. So um, then I thought I wanted to not presuppose any familiarity with the Gospels. So I tried to write thinking of uh, non-Christians in my mind who you know, didn't know things about Gospels. Uh, I'm eccentric, most people are eccentric, but I thought I'm going to try and stay away from eccentric ideas. So sometimes when people write a book on the reliability of the Gospels, they have a particular theory that, say, one particular manuscript is super, super early and that this shows the truth of the Gospels. And it all depends on that one manuscript being early. Unfortunately, they are the only scholar who thinks that that manuscript is super early, or maybe there's two of them, but it's, it's a bit of an outlier in ideas. Or you might have something like that. So I try to avoid that. Also, trying to avoid very particular theories about the relationship between the Gospels. Which was written first? Was it Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Most people think Mark, but I didn't want it to hang on a particular theory. It's actually agnostic as to the relationship between the Gospels. I wanted it not to be divisive, so it would also not uh, major on things uh, where evangelicals are likely to be divided. I also wanted not to spend a lot of time appealing to consensus. One reason not to do this is, of course, being a Christian by its very nature means going against the consensus. So if you're trying to write a book that can be used evangelistically, in which you're constantly pointing to people to the fact that, well, everyone agrees this, therefore you should go away from what everyone agrees and follow Jesus, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's, a, it's actually getting people to um, a, a get a basis in the wrong authority. At the same time, humans are social creatures. Many things we take for granted, for instance, that, that there is a planet Mars, okay? is something we don't have any direct experience of, but we believe for social reasons. In other words, because people we trust enough have said that, and enough of them, that we find it inconceivable to believe that the whole knowledge structure, uh, you know, uh, could be wrong. Now, even if you're involved in astronomy, uh, you know, at a PhD level, there'll be all sorts of things that you are taking on trust. So th that's fine. So appeal to authority f to a certain extent uh, it, it is good, you know, and, and there might be various things we believe, like that smoking tobacco is generally bad for you. Probably few, if any of us, have done real research on that. There's simply enough authority we don't question it. So it's not that appealing to authority is never, uh, uh, never right, but I wanted to avoid doing it as much as I could. I also wanted to avoid talking about scholarship as an end in itself. Sometimes what happens is people make their books almost like an introduction to the scholarship. I once wrote a review of a dictionary of the New Testament. It's called the Dictionary of the New Testament, um, uh, and a dictionary of the uh, New Testament. And um, I criticized it because it had an article on Christology, all about Christ, but it did not have an article on Christ. And if I'd read the article about Christology, I would have learned nothing more about Christ, but I would have learned to a lot of people what he said and she said about the study of Christ or the study of the nature of Christ. You see what I mean? So, in fact, um, I wanted to have as little scholarship as necessary, which I say is one primary source and one secondary source. Uh, so when, when you have, have in a footnote... Uh, that someone can check out the, the best manuscript for a particular thing, and I try and give them the reference to that, and also um, one uh, source where they can read about that more. And I wanted to make sure I referenced direct 
knowledge sources. I then thought, how shall I arrange the order? Well, I thought I should start with non-Christian sources because people are going to be more prepared to trust those if they're not believers. I fully expect that most people who read the book will be Christian believers. That's fine. But if you write for non-Christians, then the Christians can still benefit. Um, uh, so I thought that's right. Then I'd introduce the Gospels. Biggest chapter was um, whether the Gospel writers actually know the material uh, ab about, are they familiar uh, with the time and place they write about? Uh, we'll talk about undesigned coincidences in a minute. Do we have Jesus' actual words? Has the text changed? Look very briefly in six pages at contradictions in the Bible. That's not very much. And then the question of who would make this all up? Leaving miracles to the very end uh, where we simply uh, look at whether things uh, cohere. And uh, I wanted to start with some non-Christian sources. Now, in order to do that, you have to think about each of these writers and what they've, what they've done elsewhere. So one of them is called Tastus, and he wrote about the Great Fire of Rome in the year 64, when Nero uh, is thought probably to have started the fire, it's not certain, um, and blamed it on uh, some other people. But we need to get a bit of a, a sense of him. So he wrote about his father-in-law, uh, Agricola, uh, who actually was in charge of Britain. And so that's where you get the very first description of the lochs of Scotland uh, in there, uh, even though uh, Tacitus had never been there. So it's quite interesting. He's able to describe a country he's never been to and do it reasonably accurately. For instance, he says that Britain is a country constantly surrounded by clouds. So, um, uh, you know, there are some things that he was very accurate on. Um, Germany, he, he writes about the Germanic tribes. Again, one of the earliest sources of information, the Germania, the histories, and then finally the annals. And that's uh, the one that's of interest to us. And you can see that it's written around this time, so 90 years after the beginnings of Christianity, but actually in relation to the fire in Rome, uh, something more like uh, 50 years later, and uh, that's going to be quite important. And this is the particular passage, and I'll read it. But neither human help nor gifts from the emperor, that's Nero, nor all the ways of placating heaven could stifle the scandal or dispel the belief that the fire had taken place by order. That's order of Nero. Therefore, to scotch, to get rid of the rumour, Nero substituted as culprits and punished with the utmost refinements of cruelty a class of men loathed or hated for their vices, their evil doings, whom the crowd called Christians. Now, I want you to notice that word Christian for a moment, because often when you read this passage on the internet or in different books, it will say Christians there. Now, a skeptic has been saying, actually, it's not about Christians. There was another group called Christians, and so this is no evidence for Christians. Now, um, uh, here is the earliest manuscript uh, of this passage in Latin, and here we got the C and the H of Christians, and that's an R, a sort of the R drops below the line. Then you can see an I, then an S, and then a T, okay? But the I, you can see there, has a space after it, because it probably used to say E, letter E, and then uh, what happened is uh, that got rubbed out, and so it became an I. Now, why am I telling you that? Well, it's important to get into the detail of this if you're going to use these as apologetic arguments, because ideal, ideally, if you are using arguments, you only show the tip of the iceberg of your knowledge, and you've done lots and lots of preparation. Now, sometimes I think I can be tempted, others can be tempted, basically to have nothing below what we actually say. You know, we've got no extra layer if they dig, and, and I think it's important to have this. But we can see a little bit more, because then Tasta says, Christus, the founder of the name, had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius by the sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilatus, and the pernicious, that's the horrible superstition, was checked for a moment, only to break out once more, not merely in Judea, the home of the disease, uh, but in the capital, that's Rome itself, where all things horrible and shameful in the world collect and become fashionable. I don't think out of Rome, but there we are. Um, what's interesting here is that he says the crowd, sorry, the crowd, this is just here, called them Christians, Christians. But he says that the founder of the name is Christus. In other words, the crowd who doesn't know so very much calls them Christians, but 
really the name comes from Christus. And that is a very perceptive point. Because what, one of the things you realize is he's distinguishing the common perception from um, his own perception. And one of the things you notice, and I did some uh, quite detailed research on this, is that very often Christians are spelt with the E eh sound. So you know the word cretin um, and French chrétien and so on? Um, chrétien in French can come from Christianus through normal sound changes, but it could also come from Christianus. We don't uh, know. But what we can say is that there's an awful lot of texts that often use the S eh sound for, um, for Christians or Christians. So it's not just that we have the oldest manuscript of Tastus. Also, Justin Martyr in the second century is talking about Christians uh, using the word uh, krestos uh, meaning good. Um, Tertullian's Apology, complaining that people call Christians Christians. Lactantius uh, talks about Jesus as Crestus. In fact, Codex Vaticanus, that's the earliest, well, it's a very early, com uh, complete manuscript from the fourth century. Um, when it spells Christian, uses epsilon iota. Um, Pseudo Christ, epsilon iota. Antichrist, epsilon iota. And Christ, which only writes a few times that. Uh, Sinaiticus uses this. In other words, there's quite a bit of vowel variation. Why would you expect that? Well, think about when people in Europe first came across Muslims. You remember that they used to call them Mohammedans or something like that. Then they called them Moslems. And finally, in English, it turns to Muslims. Um, and, uh, you know, in different languages, um, that will have, uh, changes will have taken place uh, differently. But the point is, it, this is the one is the most accurate. In the past, in English, Quran was spelt like this. Over time, it becomes Qur, and then you have this apostrophe. It's not an apostrophe, but it looks like an apostrophe. Halfway through a word, and even President Obama would say Quran, and he would make this pause halfway through. Because if it looked like people were going to get upset if you didn't, uh, you know, people are prepared to put apostrophes in the middle of words, even though that's against all the laws of writing, you know. So, in other words, what happens is the more contact you have a, with a group, the more accurately you can say their name. Now, imagine you have this fast-growing group in Rome, and it's got some foreign-sounding word. Like, I mean, in, in Latin, you don't normally begin something with C-H-R, um, and it's Christian, it's, it's from this... Um, Greek word Christos, which is a weird word because it's trying to render literally the Hebrew word Messiah, meaning anointed. And as they first come into contact with this, and also in popular speech where it and eh aren't distinguished very much, of course they get this wrong. Now the significance of this is this also shows the integrity of the transmission of Tacitus. Because no later Christian scribe would have used the eh vowel you only get the F vowel because you have the way it was sounding right back at the beginning. So in other words, you can take what initially appears to be an objection, the uh, atheist saying it's a really a different group of people, and that's a very problematic view because you have to have this group of people who are really, really widespread in Rome, and their belief has also started in Judea, you know, and, and then they somehow disappear off the planet. It doesn't really make much sense. Um, Another mention of early Christians is uh, by Pliny. This is Pliny the Younger. His uncle died in the year 79 because he was a scientist who wanted to get closer to Vesuvius when it was erupting and paid the price of being a great scientist. Uh, but Pliny uh, became governor of northwest Turkey, and he wrote to the emperor asking for advice as to how to deal with these people, and he says this, I interrogated these people, as to whether they were Christians, if they confessed it, I repeated the question a second and a third time, adding the threat of capital punishment. If they still persevered, I ordered them to be led off to execution. So then he says that those who denied that they were or ever had been Christians, who repeated uh, after me an invocation to the gods and uh, offered adoration with wine and incense to your statue, which had ordered to be brought for this purpose, along with the images of the gods, and who finally cursed Christ, all things it said that no real Christian could be forced to do, I thought they should be discharged. So in other words, he's saying, if they give up and they worship the emperor and they worship the Roman gods, that's okay. Now think about the logic of that. The logic of that is saying um, that 
worshipping another god would be a sign that they're not Christians. Now, how could that logic work unless they've kept the categories of Judaism? And in Judaism, there's only one god, you only worship one being, and so this is an indirect testimony that the early Christians have kept the category of Judaism where there's only one god. But then he talks about people who've given up as Christians and tell them, tell him what, what they've done. Others who were named by that informer at first confessed themselves Christians, but soon after denied it, saying that they had been, but they'd ceased some three years ago, others many years ago, and a few as much as 20 years ago. They all worshipped your statue and the image of the gods and cursed Christ. They affirmed, however, the whole of their guilt or error was that they were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light and of singing in alternate verses, a hymn to Christ as to a God, Latin quasi Deo, and of binding themselves by a solemn oath not to any wicked deeds, but never to commit uh, fraud, theft, or adultery, never to falsify their word, nor to deny a pledge when they were called upon to deliver it up. Notice in their worship services, they're singing to Christ quasi Deo as if to God, and, you know, Latin, like the Slavic, many of the Slavic languages, does not have a definite or indefinite article. So we don't know, whether is this to a god, to the god? You know, it doesn't tell us. But the logic is they're not prepared to worship the Roman emperor. They're not prepared to worship the Roman gods. They are singing a song to Christ, treating him as God. That means the only way this can happen is if they have accepted that Christ is the Jewish god. Jews only have one God, and they think of him in the same category. And often people have this idea that over time, Christians had a more and more and more exalted view of God. At first they thought he was a human, then a very special human, then a very, very special human, eventually halfway to God, and so on. Mathematically impossible, because Jews never have one and a half gods. Now, you know, Romans and Greeks can have half gods all the time. Zeus, Jupiter gets together with a girl. You know, what happens? They get a half god. I mean, it's Percy Jackson is the film you can see for that. Um, but this can't happen within the Jewish categories. So this is really interesting. He then talks about how many people were Christians. Many persons of all ages and ranks and both sexes are being and will be called to trial and so on. Um, so... We can go through that, and he even talks about how it's certain, at least that the temples, which had almost become deserted, are now begin beginning to be visited again. Now think about this. His area in northwest Turkey, so many people becoming Christians that the temples are getting deserted. This is fascinating, and this fits with the same picture we have in um, Acts chapter 19. Remember, Acts chapter 19, also in Turkey, further down in Ephesus, you have the silversmiths, the silver idol makers, ha having a riot because they're so upset that many people are becoming Christians and therefore their business is going badly. It's exactly the same pattern here. So Christianity spread far and it spread fast. That doesn't prove it's true, but it does limit the ability of some models to explain what happened. So for instance, if it spread so far and fast, it's hard to explain how you can have innovations and changes to their belief taking place 20, 30, 40, 50 years after it began, and then that reaching everyone so they all agree on that. It just doesn't work like that. So um, our third witness we look at is Josephus, who's a Jewish writer. And again, he wrote four books. Uh, one of them is his autobiography. One of them is against someone criticizing the Jews. Um, he wrote a seven-volume uh, account of the Jewish war, which is really gory in terms of just the pain of people uh, who were in the conflict with Rome. Uh, and then the Jewish antiquities, where twice he mentions Christ, Jesus Christ. And in one of these, he talks about how his uh, brother James uh, actually died. Uh, what, he was killed by the high priest for his religious beliefs. In other words, you have people far away who are dying as Christians, and you have people close at hand who are dying. That's the picture we get uh, when we look at these sources. We then try to look and say, well, what about the four Gospels? And I want here to say, often people criticize us and say, where are your sources for Jesus? And I say, well, our sources for Jesus are very good. They're called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they say, well, show me some other sources. And I think, why should I show you some other sources? Because those are very good sources. Now, 
Who was the most famous person at, alive at the time of Jesus? Well, obviously the Roman emperor. He was called Tiberius. How many biographies are there of him? Four. So we have four biographies of Jesus and four biographies of Tiberius. Now, already that should make us think. How on earth does someone from Nazareth get the same number of biographies as the most famous and powerful Roman? That's an amazing thing. But then I want us to look at um, how long they all are. And what we see is these uh, biographies are on the whole a little bit shorter than these ones, with one exception, namely Tastus. But hang on, Tastus isn't a biography of uh, Tiberius, it's the annals of the whole period of Tiberius's reign. In other words, it's telling you what happened during his reign, not just telling you everything about Tiberius. You see the difference? So actually, in terms of quantities of material, these are very comparable. I actually think we have more on Jesus than we have on Tastus, or on Tiberius. Then we look at when our earliest manuscripts are by century. For this one, we have 16th century, the others 9th century, and for the Gospels, 3rd and 4th century. Earliest complete manuscripts would be 4th century. So in other words, these are all doing a lot better. And then when were they written? Well, here you can see this one is written during Tiberius's reign. Tiberius um, reigned from the year 14 to the year 37. So that is a contemporary source. But then this one is 70 years later. This one's 80 years later. This one is 160 years later. Now, for the dates of the Gospels, these are not my dates. I don't like these dates. These are dates given by Bartem and the Skeptic, by the Jewish Publication Society um, uh, Commentary on the New Testament, and by a Jewish uh, uh, scholar called Shimon Gibson. And so what I decided to do is, uh, sorry, Shaco in this one, Shaco. Um, I decided to put those together. And so these are reasonably skeptical dates, but not the most skeptical you could have. But what I'd say, even accepting those dates, the four Gospels are doing rather better, with one exception, and that is Valeus Paterculus. So let's have a think about him. The difference about Valeus Paterculus is he only writes up to the year 30, and then he goes silent, probably because he dies, so he can't cover the last seven years of Tiberius's life. But why does he die? Many people suspect he was killed by the emperor because he is the one person who was in the emperor's pay who only ever says nice things about Tiberius. Only ever nice things. He is his propagandist. Now, one thing we can say about the gospel writers is they are not receiving an earthly reward for their writing. So in terms of motives to write wrongly, they're actually different. Now, what happens is actually scholars think that this is the least reliable of the four sources and these are the more reliable ones because the picture you get from Tastus is that Tiberius killed all of his enemies and many of his friends and he was incredibly cruel and very vicious and that is also the picture of Suetonius and Cassius but of course during his reign you know, when Valeus Paterculus spoke he did nothing wrong only good things. In other words, I'm not wanting to say the Gospels are superior to what we have for the most famous Roman emperor. I'm happy for this point to just say they're equal. They're as good. This is significant because what it means is people shouldn't ever say, oh, you don't have many sources about Jesus. We have lots of sources about Jesus. But also we can say this, that some people will say, but the sources are biased, you know, because they're written by Christians. We'll at least say there's no financial incentive to the bias, no clear one, but also this, that of course most people who write about football are football enthusiasts. Most people who write about golf are golf enthusiasts. Of course most people who write about Christ are Christ enthusiasts. That's to be expected. Um, that's not a reason to dismiss them. Uh, we should take them uh, seriously. But we then get to this question. When we look at these writers, are they equipped with enough um, encyclopedic knowledge to be able to record correctly. So for instance, how many of you had never been to Viswa before coming here, before the forum? Okay, so imagine someone asks you to write a description of Viswa. 
you know, and what goes on. I mean, even now, you might struggle to write a description of this one because you only really know the hotel when you, uh, you know, get out for a walk. But um, it would be very hard to do so. Now, imagine in the ancient world where 20 miles journey is a, day, is a day's walk easily. And so for you to get accurate information about anywhere is rather difficult. It's an expensive thing. Gathering information, you, have to, you might be able to talk to travelers, but why would a traveler want to talk to you to help you write your book you know, uh, at, at, at great length? So we could ask the question, what do these writers know? And one of the things we want to look at is, do they come from the land of the events they record, or do they have accurate information about the land? So I know this is small print, but one of the things we can simply do is say, well, what are all the towns and villages and cities that they mention? And so we list them all out, and we see here that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all mention different ones. They have some of the same, and they each have different ones. And that's significant because we can compare that with apocryphal gospels, like the Gospel of Thomas, which hardly has any towns in at all. Actually, when you look at later writings, this is not trivial information to be able to get uh, in terms of just the names of uh, places, it's not obvious where you'd get this from. So uh, that means either they've been in a land where you, you know, spent time in a land where you know the names of the villages and, and so on, or it means you've had very extensive conversations with people. We can also look at their, their knowledge of regions and how they fit together. We can look at their knowledge of water bodies, uh, like the Brook Kidron. The Kidron is the little... Uh, valley that goes alongside Jerusalem. Now, how does the writer of John's gospel, let's just call him the writer of John's gospel at this stage, we're not going to presuppose it's John, how do they know about the little valley called the Kidron, which goes alongside Jerusalem? Well, one explanation is they had been there, that's one explanation. Another one could be they had some detailed conversations with someone who went to Jerusalem. But it's not a, a, just a trivial piece of information. Um, the Jordan you might be able to hear about at a greater distance. But they also, different writers, know about gardens and the Mount of Olives and a particular gate uh, of Jerusalem and so on. In fact, there's a rather interesting thing. Uh, I found out that uh, when you look at the number of words in the Gospels and the number of place names in the Gospels and you divide one by the other, you find all four Gospels have about five place names per thousand words. All four Gospels have about five place names for a thousand words. It's quite interesting. Um, my research assistant turned turn up. I was very pleased. Um, that, uh, and how do you explain this? Well, how you don't explain it is if one person is putting in place names to make the st story sound authentic, one will put in too many, one will put in too few. It won't really work. What you might do is if you're not trying, this might happen. If you're not trying, but you're simply putting in place names when relevant, it might work. Now, it's not just that they know the names of the towns. They also know the, the, the elevations to some extent. So, for instance, in Jerusalem, it always uh, is talking about going up to Jerusalem or going down from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is about 750 meters above sea level. You say, aha, that's the capital. Of course, people talk about going up to the capital. Well, not necessarily, actually. That's not always the case because, actually, Jerusalem wasn't the capital. Uh, Caesarea was the political capital, and in the uh, book of Acts, you go down to Caesarea because it's down by the coast. So it's not entirely the case. But they do talk about going up to Jerusalem, always going up to Jerusalem. It's quite a long way up to Jerusalem. Someone who's made the journey knows that. Jesus is said to have told the story, which goes, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Well, rem remember, Jericho is the lowest city on earth. So if you go down from Jerusalem to Jericho, you're going down one kilometer. You're absolutely going down. Um, this is very important. But it's not just that you have this with Jerusalem. You also have it with Nazareth, which is high up, and Capernaum, which is by the Sea of Galilee, which is also low down. It's the lowest freshwater lake on earth. Uh, so Capernaum by Galilee is about two, minus 200 meters. So that's why we see in Luke chapter 4, it says, from Nazareth, he went down to Capernaum. Or in John, he went down from Cana to Capernaum. There are three different places where Cana may be, but the lowest of them is 200 meters above sea level. So in other words, it doesn't matter which way we look at it. 
And all of these caners are roughly in the same area. The interesting thing is, by the way, the, the travel time also works very well in John 4, where you have that distant healing, and it's uh, a, you know, a day's um, journey between them. So it, all these sorts of things fit uh, very well. So these are non-trivial pieces of information. And <clears throat> here we have um, John chapter 4, where the man again repeatedly is saying, come down. We can look at a saying like this from Jesus. He pronounces a woe to three uh, different towns. Woe to you, Chorazin, a little place. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in the judgment for you, for Tyre and Sidon, than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. And then you look on a map, and you find that basically, yes, if you want to get from one to the other, you might have to walk round a hill, six miles or something, but it's only about one mile for, uh, across the hill, you know, from Capernaum to Karazin, Bethsaida is just over here. They're in a very close area. So how does whoever, you know, either Jesus said that thing, or you have a writer who has a really good sense of little villages in um, the in the land. Now, how can gospel writers get that? One thing you might say is maybe they got it from books. Well, I looked at every possible book source for this information, and none of them have the right information. So Strabo wrote a geography, but again, he wrote about the great places of the world you need to go and see. Chorazin is not on the list. Um, Pliny the Elder, you know, who lived near Vesuvius, again, he had never visited the area, but he didn't write enough detail. Tastus never visited the area, didn't have enough detail. Philo might have gone to uh, Judea, Palestine once or twice, but he doesn't have much detail. Ptolemy, the geographer and astronomer, is probably too late. And anyway, he doesn't mention enough places. The one person who does have first-hand information is Josephus, but he, mentioned, he mentions some of the same towns, but not all of the same towns. And then we have far, far too late, the year 500 around then, we have the Jewish Talmud. Now, the Jewish Talmud confirms the existence of Karazin, for instance, that it's a real place. It's not mentioned in any of the other sources. But we can't say that the Gospel writers got it from the Talmud because that's hundreds of years too late. So from all of these things, we can start building up a picture that the Gospel writers, even though they haven't all copied each other, have consistently good geographical information. Well, that doesn't prove the story is to be correct, but it does show the authors have enough of an information base, close enough contact to the place to be able to get information. It shows that they cared about correct information. It shows that they are detailed in their reporting. Those are all things that are relevant for judging trustworthiness. Now, for a bit of change, anyone recognize the um, a painter here? Rembrandt, thank you. Anyone name it? Christ on the Sea of Galilee, 1633. And uh, you've got uh, probably, I think it's Judas Iscariot just being sick over the edge there. Uh, <coughs> probably Judas, it's not completely certain. But what's interesting is, of course, that um, you know, there are these storms on the Sea of Galilee. There are two storms, aren't there, as we read through uh, the Synoptic Gospels. And each time, you remember G um, the first time Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves. Remember, it doesn't talk about rain, doesn't talk about thunder, doesn't talk about lightning, because there are different sorts of storms on the Sea of Galilee. You can have rainstorms, but they don't come up quickly. The ones that come up quickly in the Jordan Rift Valley, you know, are the windstorms. And this is correct, exactly the sort of correct detail you get, the size of boat. Uh, fitting 12 uh, people into one boat exactly fits with the discovery of a Galilean fishing boat, and so on. The Gospel writers also know the tax system. It's rather striking that it's in Mark and Matthew that you get this story of Jesus in Capernaum having a dinner with lots of tax collectors. So that means there are lots of tax collectors in Capernaum, uh, and then, uh, but that is a land border, it's the first town you come to as you come over the border 
over the River Jordan, which the, the top of the Jordan, which goes into the Sea of Galilee, as you come across from the Gaulanitis into Galilee, as you change from Herod Philip's territory to Herod Antipas's. There's another time that there's tax collectors, and that is in Luke. And here in Luke 19, you have the story of Zacchaeus, who is a chief tax collector. So the story about Zacchaeus is not in uh, Matthew and Mark. The story about dining with lots of tax collectors is not in Luke. But Jesus goes and he eats with Zacchaeus, who's a chief tax collector. And again, where is, Zac uh, where is Jericho, where he eats it? Eats, it is the first city you come to when you are coming up from the Jordan, uh, uh, um, across the Jordan from the Perea, the other side. In other words, independently, these different gospel writers have put toll collectors exactly on borders where you collect toll. And you have to go this route because there's only a few places where you can ford cross the Jordan. And then if you're wanting to get to Jerusalem, you need to go along, you know, the Wadi Celts. You need to go along that valley uh, in order to make that one kilometer rise uh, to get to Jerusalem. You can't just, you know, climb up the sheer faces of rocks you know, it's not going to work. So it's far simpler to pay the toll than to try and uh, kill yourself on the rocks, if you see what I mean. So that's why it worked. Um, so, you know, they, they get there, uh, whether it's in the north here or uh, down here in Jericho, they have their people in the right places. Another way we can look at uh, the reliability of texts is looking at way, ways, subtle ways that one text agrees with another when they agree in such small things that you can't say those small things were written in order to confirm each other, because unless you are a phenomenally close reader, you won't even notice these things. Um, and so these are things which have been spotted over time and accumulated, and uh, some of them don't require hugely close reading, but they simply are, uh, seem to be independent. So one case is this famous story in Luke chapter 10, where I'll read it. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Uh, and she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Well, for a start, we notice that these women's names, Martha and Mary, are both very appropriate names for women in Palestine. So that's significant because, again, Jews had different names in different countries. In Egypt, they have different names. There are many Jews in Turkey, many Jews in Rome. Typically in Rome, they have Latin or Greek names uh, for Jews. So uh, it's, a, it's a different picture, uh, and uh, these are plausible. Probably it looks like Martha is the homeowner. She welcomed him into her house, but she has a sister called Mary who's sitting. Notice that, sitting at the Lord's feet, and she's listening. And Martha is incredibly active and worried about practicalities. That story is in Luke and only in Luke. Then in John, we have a story in John and only in John about how their brother Lazarus has died. Jesus goes and the first thing is that as Martha hears, she gets up and runs to meet him. Meanwhile, Mary remains seated. That's interesting. That's the same position she was in in the other story. She's seated. Then Martha welcomes Jesus, which is exactly, by the way, what she did in the other story, except it's this welcoming for a meal. This time it's welcoming saying, glad you've come. Uh, and if you had come earlier, my brother wouldn't have died. Um, then Martha, who can't bear not to be active, secretly sends a message to Mary saying, he's calling for you, the master's calling for you. Now, whether he was actually calling for her, it's not clear to me as I read it, but certainly Martha isn't going to stay still. At this point, Ma Mary gets up quickly and it looks like she's going to weep in the tomb. That's what people think, um, uh, but in fact she doesn't. What she does is she goes to Jesus and falls at his feet. Now notice she's at his feet this time, just as, by the way, she was the last time, right? And then Jesus saw her weeping. 
there's no record that Martha wept. But Mary did. Uh, and then Martha says, very practically, when Jesus wants to stone rolled away, Mary, Martha is concerned about the smell. So what you have here is a, 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 an agreement, if I can put it like this, a, on the type of character involved. Martha is practical. She is active. She's not tearful, not, not explicitly tearful, you know. Mary is contemplative and more emotionally uh, involved. And it's very interesting that you have two different stories and yet the same sort of character. And this would often be what you'd happen, happen, say, in a funeral, where many of you tell stories of, of the person you remember fondly and of things that happened to them. And often you'll have two different stories with the same character traits in them. Uh, this is just... And, and I'm not saying this proves it's true. I'm, not, I'm never, not, not interested in proving the Gospels to be true. Um, what I'm saying is the explanation that it is true is a simple explanation and a beautiful explanation. You see the difference between people who often feel they need to prove something to be historically true, which is a very stupid thing to try and do, or prove that you have a simple explanation and other people's explanations are more complicated. Does that make sense? There are all sorts of things in life which are true, which you cannot prove to be true. For instance, it is estimated that there are about 78,000 rapes in the UK each year, but only about 1,200 convictions, because many things that are true cannot be proven to be true. And sometimes what we do when we make a big mistake is we think that if the Bible is true, we need to prove it to be true using the canons, the criteria of a history department. But remember, a history department is a system that's set up deliberately to reach minimal results, very, very assured results, very careful results. Um, and that is why they insist on multiple testimony. But in life generally, it would be crazy for us to live our lives in every respect insisting on multiple testimony. It simply doesn't work. Someone says, you know, um, re report something to you. Often you take it on a single testimony. Now, we must not think, and I'll go back to the Old Testament for this as well, that somehow if, a if Abraham existed, we need to be able to prove that he existed. It's a, quite a different thing. Christians simply need to show that it is reasonable to believe that he existed. It is rational to believe that he existed. It's consistent with the evidence to believe that he existed. It fits. You see, there's a difference. You're never going to find Abraham's tent. You're ne probably never going to find a piece of writing scratch where it says Abraham was here. Probably never. But you can make a very good case that these stories can be rationally trusted, that your mind is operating very, very well when you believe this to be historically true. Does that make sense? Another couple, uh, uh, this time, uh, two, we've done two sisters, let's do two brothers. Uh, in Mark, we hear of James and John, and they are called the sons of thunder. But you're not told in, J uh, in Mark why they're called the sons of thunder, they're just called the sons of thunder. Can you do anything with it? Maybe not. But then in Luke's gospel, you remember that time that James and John get really annoyed with the Samaritans. And so they say to Jesus, shall we call down fire from heaven? Well, fire from heaven is effectively lightning, isn't it? And lightning and thunder are connected, you see? So uh, one could explain the other. I, it's not something you prove, it's just something that fits. A test, may, maybe many of you heard me on this one before, with the feeding of the 5,000, where we get lots of these details fitting together where in uh, Mark and John there's mention about the grass at the feeding of the 5,000. Is that just a little detail made to m make you think the story's authentic? Or, or is it something that's actually an eyewitness testimony? Well, let's press on. But Mark tells you that just before this, many people are coming and going. There's lots of traveling. That's why Jesus needs to go to a deserted place to get away from the busyness. But it doesn't explain why many people are coming and going. But John tells you that it, uh, it was Passover time. And of course, Passover time is the greatest time of traveling in the Jewish calendar because people go to Passover. So one detail, in a sense, fits with the other. John then tells you 
that Jesus turned to Philip and asked him where he could get bread from for the crowds. And then Andrew gets involved uh, in the reply. Um, why does he turn to Philip? Why Philip and Andrew? Well, it doesn't tell us. But John, uh, Luke tells us that the feeding took place near Bethsaida. And if you go to the beginning of John's Gospel, you find out that Philip and Andrew were from Bethsaida. So in other words, um, if you read through John's Gospel on its own, you see no significance whatsoever to this information. If you plug in the information from Luke, suddenly it makes sense that he turns to a man with local knowledge and he and another man are involved in the conversation. Even the little detail that the little boy had barley loaves fits with the time of Passover when you just had the barley harvest. Then you ask yourself, but what about the grass? Is the grass really green? Well, why don't you get a precipitation chart from a nearby town and you see when we have Passover, it has to be around April, and we just had five of the greatest months of precipitation. So in other words, it fits. Now, does this prove the miracle? No, absolutely, it does not prove the miracle. I can't prove miracles to anyone. But I can say this. Many people explain miracles in the Bible by saying that the stories were told and repeated again and again, and the miracles got exaggerated. The problem with this mechanism is it has to have the central part of the story exaggerated, while the peripheral and small parts of the story seem to be well preserved. So you have to have selective corruption of information. And what's your mechanism for selective corruption of information? I offer a simpler explanation, which is simply that the whole lot has been um, handed down together. That brings us on to the subject of manuscripts. Can we trust the manuscripts that we have over time? Well, here, why don't we look at um, Erasmus and his Greek New Testament. So in 1516, he comes out with the Greek New Testament. 16th century, his earliest manuscripts are 12th century, okay? Has no, and that's a huge gap. Now, the way Bart Ehrman runs his rhetoric is he says, what could have happened in that gap? There's such a huge gap. You know, changes could have happened. And it's really interesting for me that, of course, the at the time of the Reformation, the gap between the earliest manuscripts and the New Testament was far, far bigger than it is now. And yet, and belief in the New Testament was far, far bigger in the West than it is now which is really interesting because what it shows is even though we have more evidence now, we have less belief. So there is no linear uh, correlation between the amount of evidence and the amount of belief. In fact, there's in, almost an inverse relationship at this point. Now, since then, manuscripts have been found that are a lot earlier. Uh, this is probably from the early third century, the opening of John's Gospel. Here's uh, the beginning of, uh, in the beginning was the word, en arche en hologos. You can Maybe see logos, L-O-G-O-S. Uh, in the beginning was the word. And what we found is when we made uh, an edition of the Greek New Testament, uh, which I've actually brought with me, um, this is at Tindo House. So Dirk Jonkint, a uh, great scholar of the New Testament. And this is a Greek New Testament we edited. So it's the Greek inside, published by Crossway and Cambridge University Press. Um, and uh, when we, looked, we did 10 years work on that and working with the early manuscripts, we found that... We were no different from Erasmus's edition of 1516 for the first 14 verses of the New Testament. That is a total of 188 words or 812 letters in a row. We're exactly the same, even though our manuscripts were nine centuries earlier than his. So that's a rather significant thing because what it shows us is that over the documented period, there's not a lot of change. Now, what Bart Ehrman and many skeptics will say, well, what about the period before documentation? Well, I just want to say it's simpler to suppose that before documentation, things were similar to how they are after documentation. In other words, I don't need to prove that the text hasn't changed, you know, any more than that, because that's proving a negative, uh, any more than I need to prove that I am not also in another room at the same time as now. Do I need to prove that? I don't think so. You know, I mean, I'm here. That, does that prove I'm not in another room at the same time? Not really. But I, you don't need to prove that to be able to rationally assume that, it, you see? So in other words, someone says, prove something hasn't changed. Well, that's asking me to prove a negative, and you'll never be able to do that. Even if you had a photograph of Moses coming down Mount Sinai 
with the tablets from God, you wouldn't prove he hadn't changed them just round the corner before he came down. See? So there will always be that room for skepticism. But you don't say, I can prove the text hasn't changed. You say, I have no reason to think that it has changed. And I have good reasons to think it hasn't changed. In other words, if what happens before my earliest witnesses is anything like what happens after they come, then things have been carefully copied. What uh, skeptics often do is they posit something completely unattested into the gap. But the simpler hypothesis is to extrapolate into the gap something that is attested. But what we found is it's not just that our Greek New Testament does this. Actually, the German Bible Society's Greek New Testament, the uh, American um, scholarly society called the Society of Biblical Literature, which is also um, part of the um, American um, Society, of, well, Learned Societies. It's one of the American you know, official learned societies, as well as this one made based on the Byzantine text. All of them have the same letters for the first 14 verses of John's Gospel. Now, that's a good example. There are other examples that go differently. Some people talk about, say, the woman caught in adultery as a passage, which is not in the earliest manuscripts. But the thing is, Erasmus, 500 years, knew about that. People have known for a very long time about questions about these passages. As we discover more and more evidence, we're not discovering new passages on which doubt is shed. So then we come to this final question, who would make this all up? And that's where I think we have a number of features with Jesus that seem to make some patterns. You remember John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word. I think one of the things we can say there is Jesus is the communication from God, and Jesus is the one who explains all that there is. Um, and so some people, when they hear of miracles, think that it spoils the pattern because you have science, which is, assumes naturalism, they believe, and miracles spoil the pattern. If you can have pixies and fairies and angels and gods and Jesuses performing spooky stuff, doesn't it spoil the science? That's the sort of way uh, the argument works. Um, to which I would say that Christians, when we believe in miracles, are not believing in random miracles. We believe that um, miracles form signal patterns, okay? That whenever God uh, uses miracles, they have some semantic significance. There's some signaling that's going on, and they occur in the context of communication. So that's one thing. Um, so does that spoil science? No, it doesn't. But also, we believe that Jesus is the organizing principle for all reality. In other words, it's not that I'm asking people to accept that there is this haunted house over there, here, and there is this paranormal experience over here, and there's this UFO over there. I'm asking people to accept one single explanation, namely that Jesus is the Son of God. And from that, we will get a whole load of things explained. For instance, the Old Testament. Now, some skeptics, like Richard Carrier, who's a skeptic who tries to argue Jesus didn't even exist, he will argue that Jesus probably didn't exist because look how much of his life fits with the Old Testament. And I just say, Richard, I so agree with you how much of Jesus' life fits with the Old Testament. But there are certain things of this that it's very hard to engineer. For instance, the Jewish Talmud, so written by Jews, affirmed that Jesus existed and that he was hanged on the eve of Passover, right? That's exactly when John's Gospel says he died. But also, that's an amazing thing because of all of the times of the year to die, to sweep up symbolism from the Old Testament, this is the most convenient time to die. What is more, by dying on a cross, and a cross is a type of tree, in fact, it's used, the same words used, made of wood. Uh, that is about the best symbolic way of dying you could possibly have to echo something right back from the beginning of the Bible, where it is from uh, some wood where, um, uh, you know, the, the, the fruit is taken and sin comes. And this all happens not just any old place, it happens right near Jerusalem. Uh, uh, you know, and you start getting all of these patterns about Jesus, many of which are 
uh, well accepted by everyone, and you say, I can explain all of these, as well as many others, in one go. I can explain why there are Old Testament texts which talk about God being born as a child. If I am just trying to explain um, Isaiah chapter 9 on its own, I may have difficulties. I can explain Isaiah 9 and Isaiah 53, where there's a passage which talks about someone in at least four different ways it describes him dying, being buried, cut off from the land of the living, but then it talks about him keep on living afterwards. And so you start getting all these things together. One single explanation will account for everything, namely that Jesus is the Son of God. So there I uh, present this and I say, well, look, you can explain away all of the arguments for the reliability of the Gospels, if you like. You really can. No one's coercing you, but you will end up creating a very complicated system. I am offering you something very simple and something beautiful. And simplicity is an important criterion for truth. Remember, there's an infinite number of hypotheses to explain anything. An infinite number of hypotheses to explain anything. You can always invent super intelligent aliens or other universes or whatever it is to explain any particular thing. There's not an infinite number of simple hypotheses to explain things. You see the difference? That's why simplicity comes in. I can always keep on um, multiplying elements to my hypothesis ad hoc to explain something. But there's not an infinite number of simple hypotheses. And that's where we come to just the simplicity and the beauty of the gospel as the argument for its truth.